Today on the Matt Walsh Show, Republicans have the chance to flip the Supreme Court, rescue it from the clutches of left-wing radical activist judges, and potentially save millions of unborn lives in the process. But some so-called conservatives are arguing that it would be unprincipled for Republicans to take advantage of that opportunity. We'll talk about that. Also, five headlines, including Chris Cuomo giving a constitution lesson to Don Lemon on CNN last night. That's how bad it's gotten. And in our daily cancellation, I will finally cancel the entire country of Japan. It's all, the entire country is canceled. We'll do that um, at the end of the show, of course. First, I want to tell you about policy genius. You know, you're not going to be around forever. None of us will. And that's why I know for me, I consider it my responsibility to take care of my family and those I love. That's why I need life insurance. And so do you. September is National Life Insurance Awareness Month, which is great. But with everything going on right now, a lot of people aren't even aware if it's possible, don't even know that it's possible to, uh, to buy life insurance at all. Good news is that um, you can, and it's still easy to shop for life insurance right now. And if you have loved ones, depending on your income, you probably should. Right now, you could save $1,500 or more a year by using Policy Genius to compare life insurance policies. When you're shopping for a policy that could last for a decade or more, those savings really start to add up. So you're saving a lot of money in the long run. Even the short run, you're saving a lot of money as well. Policy Genius is an insurance marketplace built and backed by a team of industry experts. Here's how it works. Step one, you head to policygenius.com. In minutes, you can work out how much coverage you need, compare quotes from top insurers to find your best price. Step two, you apply for your lowest price. Step three, well, that's really it. Policy Genius will handle all the paperwork and red tapes. There's really only two steps for you, and they're very easy. It's definitely been my experience with Policy Genius. Very easy to do. You can navigate your way through it with ease. Um, and I love how Policy Genius does all the hard work for me. So uh, it, it's really as simple as that. If you need life insurance, head to policygenius.com right now to get started. You could save $1,500 or more a year by comparing quotes on their marketplace. Uh, Policy Genius, when it comes to insurance, it's nice to get it right. One other note um, before we get going today, please remember in a few days, all of my content, all of my shows will be on my personal channel, not here on Daily Wire's YouTube channel, if you're watching this on YouTube right now, okay? If you're listening to, you know, you can still get it on, on iTunes and in many other places, but if you're watching on YouTube, you have to go to youtube.com slash Matt Walsh and subscribe to my channel. So do that after the show, youtube.com slash Matt Walsh. Okay, now, I have never much liked the phrase establishment conservative, um, Establishment brings to mind something like an actual cabal or cartel of Republicans meeting in secret smoky rooms, hatching dastardly plans. I think the actual reality of the establishment conservative, so-called, does not involve cabals or secret rooms, and certainly not smoky secret rooms. There's less of a conspiracy and more of a, of a mutual instinct to shrink away from serious ideological fights and to protect one's reputation by acting and speaking in a way that will not offend the sorts of people that these sorts of people want to be admired by. All of that said, I will, I will use establishment conservative today just, just for lack of a better term. It may not be the best description, but it is succinct at any rate, so we'll use it. And so I can report that establishment conservatives seem to finally be getting on the same page in the, in the wake of Justice Ginsburg's death. They've, they've tried desperately to think of a way to take these winning cards we've been dealt and lose the hand anyway. And that's what they're very good at doing. They all, it seems, have come up with the same plan. So here's Jonah Goldberg in the LA Times. I'll read a little bit of this. He says, towards the end of his piece, he says, what some now dismiss as politics and posturing are actually important considerations that honor the conservative distinction between can and should and fall under such antiquated notions as statesmanship, prudence, legitimacy, consistency, and precedent. These concepts put maintaining the long-term health of our institutions above the demands of the moment. Take Senator Lindsey Graham, who promised in 2016 that if an opening were to come up in the last year of President Trump's term, a nominee would not be considered until after the election. By going back on that promise in such spectacular fashion, he's not merely debasing himself, he's also teaching people that nothing politicians say matters. By the way, is there, is there anyone over the age of 12 who needs to be taught that lesson? Really? You mean politicians will lie? I had no idea. Scandalized. Anyway, he continues, moreover, merely on the level of real politic, abandoning all considerations other than what you can get away with amounts to preemptive, preemptive disarmament for the wars to come. The pernicious logic of apocalyptic politics works on the assumption that the long term doesn't matter, but the long term always becomes now eventually. This is why the Senate could use some posturing in politics right now. Republicans have the ability to replace Ginsburg before the election or immediately after an lame duck session. 
that is a huge bargaining chip. And given that the GOP's majority is so slim, it's a chip that can be traded even by even a handful of Republican senators. So here's the deal that he proposes. A few Republicans could agree to postpone the process until after the election in exchange for a few Democrats agreeing never to vote for a court packing scheme. This would give voters some buy-in for whatever happens next. Okay. Um, Did you get that? The plan here is for Republicans to choose not to vote on a justice as long as Democrats pinky promise, really pinky promise, okay, like super serious, to never pack the court in the future. David French in Time agrees. He says, Uh, What can be done? An increasing number of center-right legal scholars, including the American Enterprise Institute's Adam White and George Mason Law School, uh, Professor Ilya Soman, are proposing a variant of of an approach best summed up as make them keep their word. It goes something like this. First, Trump makes his pick. Second, the the Senate applies the Schumer principle and gives the nominee a hearing. This will have the benefit of giving the American people a more complete picture of the qualifications and philosophy of the nominee, and thus the stakes of the presidential election. Third, then, um, the Senate then applies the Graham-Rubio-Cruz rule and does not vote before the election. If Trump wins, they then vote on the nominee. Now, there have been other articles in Reason, uh, The Bulwark, others have echoed this same plan. Republicans declined to confirm a nominee, which, you know, confirming a nominee would potentially flip the court in favor of constitutionalism in the process, save millions of lives. Decline to do that. In return, the Democrats promise with all their heart and souls to never pack the court. Now, the problems with this plan are, are, I think, obvious, but let's discuss them anyway. First of all, we should emphasize this again. There is absolutely no reason whatsoever to not confirm Trump's picks. Okay, This is not even a problem that we need to be thinking about. There is nothing whatsoever strange or outrageous or controversial about a duly elected president putting forth a judicial nominee and duly elected senators confirming or not confirming that nominee. This is what they were elected to do. There is no reason not to do it. French and Goldberg and and the others, they go on and on about about principle and how somehow, in some way, it violates principle for the president and the Senate to, to perform their constitutional duties. This is nonsense. It is abject nonsense. The only thing it potentially violates is what some of them said in 2016. Well, so what? Who cares? Some Republicans made a bad argument for not holding a vote for Garland. They said that, uh, you know, uh, they shouldn't do it because there's an election coming up. That was a bad argument. That was a dumb argument. They should have said they aren't going to vote because they refuse to allow another activist on the court and they have the constitutional authority to prevent it. And so they will. And they also, and they could have pointed out, they also have the mandate from their constituents demanding that they prevent it. That's what they should have said. Instead, they made a bad, stupid argument. Are they now, because of principle, required to live by that bad argument forever? If you do the right thing, but you justify it with faulty reasoning, are you now required to live by that faulty reasoning for the rest of your natural life? If I save a kitten from getting run over and someone asks me why I saved it and I say, well, because it's Tuesday. Does that mean that from then on, I must allow kittens to be run over on Wednesday and Thursday? Or should I just continue saving the kittens, even if my initial reasoning for doing it must be adjusted or abandoned? Now, that was a weird analogy, granted, but I think it works. Even if it doesn't work, it just demonstrates my point about faulty reasoning. Um, Second point, we cannot make a deal like this with Democrats because it relies on Democrats keeping their word. Not just their word, but future Democrat politicians have to honor the word of previous ones. The thing is, I wouldn't trust Democrats to honor their word, period, but I wouldn't even expect them to honor the word of some other Democrats from years ago. I couldn't even blame them for breaking that word. I just, I can't believe that men like French and Goldberg really think that a plan like this is feasible or plausible or coherent. It's like if a guy has taken 10 hostages and he's demanding $10 million in a plane ride out of the country, So you give him the $10 million and the plane, and you tell him to take the hostages with him, but when he gets wherever he's going, he has to promise to let them go. That's not a deal. That's not a negotiation. That's not a compromise. That's just simply giving the other side everything they could ever want. And in this case, it would be like doing it when the hostage taker has no gun and no bomb. You have all the ammo. You hold all the cards. They can't even say, and yet you still give him everything he wants. 
This is what passes for principle among some on the right. It is so weak and limp and pathetic that I can almost feel my testosterone levels dropping as I read some of these pieces. Now, here's what we must understand about Democrats, okay? They say that conservatives are racist, fascist Nazis in league with the Klan. And they say that, uh, that you know, conservatives want to control women and remove their autonomy and enslave them like the Handmaid's Tale. And the thing is, they really believe it. Or at least they act as if they do. And what that means is that they're going to do everything in their power and tell any lie they need to tell in order to, in order to stop those oppressive, woman-enslaving, neo-Nazi savages. That's why the, you know, the Kavanaugh hearings went the way they did. They, they could act to destroy this man, destroy his family, slander him, defame him, ruin him. And they could feel entirely justified and noble every step of the way. After all, they're up against Nazis, remember? Wouldn't you accuse a Nazi of gang rape if that's what you needed to do in order to stop, stop him from seizing power? Of course, the difference is that Republicans aren't actually Nazis. So that's all a bunch of histor- hysterical bull****. On the other hand, Democrats are actually infanticidal radicals who believe that it's morally acceptable to dismember a fully developed infant and throw the pieces into a dumpster. That is the truth. They really believe that. That is their real life position. And they want a court that reflects it and shares it and advances it. What that means is that the ruthlessness they show when it comes to the Supreme Court or anything else is not morally justified because the basis for it is false and their actual objectives are evil. But for Republicans, it is morally justified to do whatever must be done within the bounds of the law to stop them. The basis for our actions is not false. It is really true. That is what we're up against. And you are not a principled conservative unless you are willing to look into that darkness, confront it, acknowledge it, and fight it with all you have. Let's go to our five headlines. You know, I'm a big believer in uh, in reading. I think it's really important to read books, to set aside time to read, to learn. You know, uh, that's been my point about about. Uh, you know things like going to college, and 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 the thing is, whether you go to college or not, whatever you do for for your education, if you don't continue learning every day of your life, even after you graduate, then you know a, a few years after college, you're you're you're, you're going to be just as dumb as anybody else. Uh, learning is something that has to happen every single day. We have to continue to learn. If you get out of school, no matter how much time you spend in school, if you get out and then and then just stop learning from then on. It's, it was all a waste of time because you're going to forget everything. You're not going to retain. It has to be a continual process. The problem is finding time to learn. And uh, that's where our latest sponsor, Thinker, comes in. You know, our fast-paced world is tough to make, to make reading a priority, at least it used to be. Now with Thinker.org, they summarize the key ideas from new and no- noteworthy nonfiction, giving you access to an entire library of great books in bite-sized form. You can read or listen to hundreds of titles in a matter of minutes. They've got old classics. They've got recent bestsellers. They've got, they've got a, a huge library of books that you can go and check out. Um, and these are, you know, if you don't have the time to read the entire book, you can just you can go and you can get the the basic insights. I've been using Thinker for a long time, and um, I I love it. I think it's great. Thinker offers a large variety of titles across many categories, from current affairs to politics, business, education, history, relationships. Um, You'll even find titles from a guy named Matt Walsh. The Unholy Trinity is there, and uh, there's Ben Shapiro's Right Side of History is there. It doesn't stop there, though. There's tons of titles. What I would what I would recommend is just go to thinker.org and check out the titles, take a look at what they have, uh, and you're going to find plenty of stuff there where you, where you say to yourself, well, I'd like to learn about that. I don't have time to read the whole book. I'd like to learn about it, though. And um, you can do that. If you want to challenge your preconceptions, expand your horizons, become a better thinker, Go to thinker.org, that's T-H-I-N-K-R.org to start a free trial and download the app today. Let them know you heard about them on the Matt Wall Show. That's thinker.org. Okay, let's get to our uh, five headlines. I just saw this um, come across my desk. Didn't really come across my desk. I just like to phrase it that way. Uh, that Mitt Romney has announced that he will vote, that that uh, that he's in favor of of voting on a nominee before the election. I guess there, there are people who are surprised by that. They thought that, you know, would, would Romney be one of the, the squishes who said we should wait till after the election? I'm not surprised by it at all. 
actually, uh, because you have to understand Mitt Romney is a senator from Utah. He represents Utah. And uh, if you know anything about Utah, the voters in Utah, extremely socially conservative, they were they are not going to tolerate the guy who represents them standing in the way of potentially flipping the court in favor of pro-life you know, and, and conservatism. That was just not going to happen. So Romney really has no choice, which is a credit to the voters in Utah. Um, but we, we, we still have a long way to go because right now the votes are lined up, but Democrats have barely even begun to launch their assault on uh, Trump's nominee, who hasn't even been officially named yet. And so we'll see. Right now they've got, whatever, 53 votes. We'll see if all those Republicans um, hold the line. I, I think Romney will, no matter what, because like I said, I don't think he has a choice. His, 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 his base, his voters in Utah won't tolerate it. Other, other senators like Susan Collins, we'll see. Okay, just to give you an idea, we move on to number one here, just to give you an idea of how bad the bias is in media, here's a conversation between Don Lemon and Chris Cuomo last night, where Cuomo is the sane and rational one in the dialogue. Listen. If the Democrats were in control of the Senate right now, and Trump was president, and he wanted to nominate a justice, what do you think they'd say? Well, I think they'd do the same thing they did in 2016. They, they'd do it. That's, That's what right. they did. That's my point. That's, That's why did. nobody so, cares what the Democrats are saying now. No, 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 no. I think they do exactly what they did in 2016. You can say what you want about Democrats. Democrats usually wet the bed. They're not as strategic you when it comes to politics. You think they give Trump I a justice that, after I, what happened with Merrick Garland? I think if, they, if yes. I think they'd abide by, well, well, it's different because... It's different because Democrats did not make the promise. See, you keep comparing things that aren't equal. Democrats did not make the same promise in 2016. It wasn't a promise. Democrats were on the other side. They said. It wasn't a promise. Okay. It was a BS All right, rationale semantics. to explain what they were doing semantics. to deprive them of power. Semantics. They didn't allow the, 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 his, his nominee to go through. They wouldn't even have a hearing. They said, we're not going to do it. So that wasn't Democrats doing that. That was Republicans doing it. And if you come on this side, I don't know what Democrats would do. Democrats they may, back in 2016. It, it would not mean that they were being hypocritical if oh, they did hey. it. Okay, so you see, yeah, he, the dude really claimed there that Democrats, if they were in control, would allow Trump's nominee to go through. They, they would cooperate with Trump and play fair, Lemon says. That's, that's, that's what we're getting. So we're just, we're just pretending that they, did, that they didn't try to stop a Trump nominee by accusing him of serial gang rape. By the way, Republicans stopped an Obama nominee by not holding a vote, which is an authority and power they had legally. Democrats stopped or tried to stop a, a, a Republican nominee by orchestrating a smear campaign and accusing him of being a, the ringleader of a gang of teenage rapists. Okay, One of those methods is an assault on the rule of law and norms and decency. The other is not. And uh, you know, I'll let you guess which is which. Later in the same conversation, to make matters worse, Cuomo had to explain the Constitution to Don Lemon. He, Cuomo had to become the, the constitutional scholar in the conversation. Watch. No matter what happens, everybody sticks to the We're going to have team. to blow up the entire system. And you know what we're going to have to do? No, I don't know about You know that. what we're going to Yes, yeah. what you're going to have to do? You just got to vote. Honestly, from what your closing argument is, you're going to have to get rid of the Electoral College. Because the people, I don't see it. Uh, because the, the minority in this country decides who the judges are, and they decide who the president is. is but you that, need a is constitutional amendment to do that. And if Democrats, if Joe Biden wins, Democrats can stack the courts, and they can do that amendment, and they can get it passed. Well, you that's need two thirds vote in the Congress and three quarters of the state legislature. They may be able to do that. Maybe. Yeah, it's pretty clear from that conversation there that Don Lemon really thought. That just by taking what if 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 Democrats had just a simple majority in the Senate, they could amend the Constitution. That's all it would require. Uh, a, a profoundly stupid individual is Don Lemon, um, and also a partisan, dishonest hack. On top of it, that's that's a, that's a tough break when you're you know stupid as well as incredibly dishonest. Which is why for me, it's like I you know, that's why I figure I know I'm stupid, so I might as well try to be honest. Like I got to have something going for me at least. Let's go to number two. Uh, Ellen DeGeneres was back on the air yesterday. In her opening monologue, she addressed all of the accusations that uh, have been circling around out there that she's a monstrous sociopath who mistreats everybody around her. And uh, here she is addressing it. As you may have heard, this summer there were allegations of a toxic work environment at our show. And then there was an investigation. I learned that things happened here that never should have happened. I take that very seriously, and I want to say I am so sorry to the people who were affected. 
I know that I'm in a position of privilege and power, and I realize that with that comes responsibility, and I take responsibility for what happens at my show. This is the Ellen DeGeneres Show. I am Ellen DeGeneres. My name is there. My name is there. My name is on underwear. <laughs> We have had a lot of conversations over the last few weeks about the show, our workplace, and what we want for the future. We have made the necessary changes, and today we are starting a new chapter. Yeah, I have to say, less than inspiring. Um, I, I, you know, I, I felt like she was just taking whatever BS spiel she gave to the staff during the staff meeting, you know, when they first got together, and repeating it here. Also, the whole idea that she found out about bad things that happened is obviously bogus because the whole controversy and scandal was that she was the one doing the bad thing. So she's claiming that she she found out about the things that she herself was allegedly doing. Now, you could always say, of course, that you don't believe all these stories about Ellen DeGeneres. And um, I fully agree that false accusations do happen. But there is a certain point, right, where, you know, I mean, dozens of people who who have worked with you and have been around you are all saying the same things about you and telling the same kinds of stories. There's a point where there's no plausible reason to disbelieve it. And then what's also conspicuous is that all these people coming out, some on the record, some off the record, saying El DeGeneres is just an absolute sociopath and is horrible to everybody and and all of that. Uh, Like you you can't even look her in the eyes when she walks down the hallway, that kind of thing. There's really, there was really nobody, very, very few people coming out in defense of her and saying, no, you know what? This is crazy. She's a wonderful person. Very few people saying that. And that's, that really, you know, that's, that's an indication that there's an issue. When everyone who's ever been around you agrees that you're a scumbag and almost no one who's been around you will say otherwise, well, you know, I think probably we can draw some conclusions at that point. Number three from the Daily Wire, uh, it says NBA superstar LeBron James claims that the votes of black people do not matter in America noting that he's seen recounts and apparent suggesting that black votes have been intentionally voided in his lifetime. Um, James said, black people in the community don't believe that their vote matters. And he was explaining why he was apathetic about voting when he was younger. We grow up and don't think that our vote actually matters. It doesn't. We've seen recounts before. We've seen our voices be muted our whole lives. And then he goes on from there. Yes, uh, LeBron James, superstar, mega celebrity, I mean, everything he says is headline news, but his voice is being muted. LeBron James's voice is being muted. Let me let me just ask LeBron at this point. Um, Maybe you could just tell us, LeBron, how much attention do you need the whole world to pay to you before you will agree that you're not being oppressed? Like, how much is needed? Because right now, do do you need? I guess my question is. Do you actually need everyone in the world to to do nothing with their lives but listen to you and talk about you? Is that what you require in order to not be oppressed anymore? Because apparently being a multimillionaire, mega, super famous celebrity, that's not enough. So just just let me know what you you need. Do, Do you need all of the fame and all of the money in the entire world in order to, because if so, just let us know, LeBron, because this, the world is here for you. That's, that's why we all exist, it's simply for you. And so all you have to do is let us know what you need, and we'll be here for you. Yeah, I mean, nothing, nothing irresponsible or reckless about that, right, though, by the way. The, a, a, you know, LeBron James claiming that black people's votes are being discarded or thrown out, or what, just, no basis for that whatsoever, he's just making that up. So he says that, he goes out saying that we're being hunted in the street, no basis for that either. But all of the, uh, all of the, the requisite uh, chaos and anarchy and everything that, that, that comes from false narratives like this, LeBron's not susceptible to any of that. He's, he's protected from that behind his, his gated house in his mansion, so he doesn't care. Great guy, that LeBron James. Number four, AOC, Alexandria Casa cortez has a message that um, I actually agree with. This may be the first thing she's ever said that I agree with. Listen. I'm sorry to tell you, you're not going back to brunch. We're not going back to brunch. That's not happening. I have to say, I could not agree more. Um, I don't think anybody should be going to brunch. I agree with her. Brunch is for cowards who don't want to step up and choose between lunch or breakfast. I've always said that. You know, it's no wonder that women, brunch is very popular with women. What does that tell you? Because women are notorious 
for, for being totally unable to make food-related decisions. And so they invented this brunch thing because they can't even decide what meal they want to have. If you're having brunch, then that means it's a time, you know, it's what, what brunch is going to be 10, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. So that, that's a time when you could, you could either be having a late breakfast or an early lunch. And I think it's up for you to have some conviction and decide. And FYI, if you have to choose between lunch and breakfast, always choose breakfast. I think that I, th- I, I, I think we can all agree on that. Number five, the Emmys happened on Sunday, hosted by Jimmy Kimmel. Um, I didn't watch the show. Uh, I, I was going to watch it, but then somebody offered to come to my house and stab me in the jaw with a rusty screwdriver instead. And I just thought that that was a much more appealing way to spend my time. And it just so happens that there's no shortage of people who would be willing to stab me in the jaw with a rusty uh, screwdriver. So it kind of works out. So I didn't watch it, but I did. Uh, there was one segment from the show that caught my eye after the fact, as it's been making the rounds online. This is, a, a, I guess, supposed to be a comedy bit between host Jimmy Kimmel and actor Anthony Anderson. But the cringe factor here is off the charts. Watch. Before we announce the nominees, you know, I have a few things that uh, I'd like to say. You do? Yes, I oh. do. Because in rehearsal, I thought we decided that we're just going to... You know, we have a record number of black Emmy nominees this year, which is great. This is the part where the white people start to applaud. Oh. And nod. Oh. Thank you, Jimmy. All right, these Emmys would have been all-star... These Emmys would have been NBA All-Star Weekend and Wakanda, all wrapped in one. This was supposed to be the blackest Emmys ever. Y'all wouldn't have been able to handle how black it was going to be. But but because of COVID, we can't even get in the damn building. This isn't what it should have been, Jimmy. But but you know what? I'm still rooting for everybody black. Because black stories, black performances, and black lives matter. Say it with me, Jimmy. Black Black lives lives matter. matter. Louder, Jimmy. Black Black lives lives matter. matter. Louder, Jimmy. Say it so that Mike Pence can hear it. Black Black Lives lives Matter. matter. That's right. And because Black Lives Matter, black people will stay at home tonight to be safe, which is fine because guess what? Y'all don't know how to light us anyway. No. Jimmy, I'm glad I got that off my chest. I am too. I am too. Yeah. I'm glad uh, you did. I'm I'm, I'm appreciative that you've given me a safe space to say this from. No, it's my pleasure. You know that. Yes. Uh, Could you scoot over so I can stand on this star? Okay. Yes, I will. Bring out. All right. Yes, that was the most uncomfortable thing I've ever seen in my life. It was it was it was cringe comedy, but not in a good way. Cringe comedy minus the comedy, just pure cringe all the way down. What was the comedy supposed to be exactly? This is the ritual humiliation of a neutered white man. Now, I admit, sort of grotesquely fascinating to watch in a certain way, but not really funny. Now, if this wasn't the Emmys, you know, if, if this was, we know this isn't the case in the Emmys, but if it, if it wasn't the Emmys, I might think that this was supposed to be a parody of BLM and its constant demands for pledges of allegiance and a parody of the pathetic little puppy dogs like Kimmel who bark on command as they're told. But I don't think it, it is a parody. Um, I think it's it's just exactly what we've been seeing. In fact, there was another example of it. Uh, we've seen these, you know, mobs of BLM people walking down the, the road and demanding that, you know, di- diners at restaurants put up the black power fist and all of that. Here was another recent example from a few days ago. Um, let's, let's take a look at this. Yeah, say because Black Lives Matter, homie. Say Black Lives Matter right now. Black Lives Matter. Say Black Lives Matter, bro. No. You didn't? I didn't hear no. bro. Okay, say, say it. Let him talk. Let him talk. Let him talk. Let him talk. Thank bro. you. All right, thank you. Yeah, that was in Portland, I believe, of course. And that dude, he got his truck smashed anyway, apparently. He did what he was told, and then he came out, and the truck was still smashed. He performed the choreography, danced the jig, jumped through the hoops. And they still went after him anyway. That's the way it goes, because that's the way it always goes. And when I say that's the way it always goes, I mean, I'm talking about going back through history, okay, way before BLM. This is how evil oppressors always operate. This is one of the hallmarks of oppressors, is that they demand pledges of allegiance, displays of fealty, whether sincere or not. 
one of the most common things that tyrants do is that they 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 need you to at least pretend. They need you to say the words and perform the actions. Your person because your personal views are irrelevant to them. They don't care about that. It's your submission they want. So BLM is following this script, and there's a lot of historical precedent for it. None of it good, but there's a lot of it. On the other hand, you know you notice how you never see gangs of of uh, pro lifers at the March for Life. You never see them gathering around uh, someone and, and demanding that the person express their support for the pro-life cause. That never happens because pro-lifers really care about their professed cause and their professed cause is saving babies. And coerced statements of, of, of support from people who are scared of you know getting their asses kicked by a, a mob of angry people, that does nothing to advance the cause of saving babies. Now, for BLM, Antifa, et cetera, the real cause is control. And coerced statements of support really do advance that cause. And they would advance it no matter what the statement was. It doesn't even matter what it is. They might as well demand that you do the Macarena or, you know, sing, she'll be coming around the mountain. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what you're doing or what it is. It, 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 they say, oh, say Black Lives Matter, put up the fist. That doesn't even make a difference. The whole point is simply to train you to do what they say. And that's it. That's all they want. All right, let's get to our um, daily cancellation. Okay, this will be a quick one today. I just need to to cancel Japan real quick. Just just get in, cancel Japan, get out. I don't think I'll need more than three minutes to cancel a whole whole country. Um, It's it's that easy. Japan Japan today is being canceled for this. We'll play the footage for you. There it is. Um, Now, this is a giant robot that they're building in Japan. I'm told this is a life-sized Gundam. I have no idea what a Gundam is. I assume that's Japanese for spectacular waste of money. I don't know. Now, you can see here all the things this robot can do. And by all the things, I mean it can, it can give a thumbs up. It can move its arms. It can kneel. Even giant robots pander to Black Lives Matter, apparently. But, but that's all it can do. It can't fly. It can't shoot lasers. It can't do anything else. Now, I ask you. What the hell function will a giant 60-foot robot that gives a thumbs up serve? Well, I'll tell you what the function is. It serves the function of Japan being able to say to the world, hey guys, look at this thing that we did. And the world goes, oh, cool. And that's it. That's the whole purpose. Think of how many man hours went into this. How many people worked on it. There are people who spent years going to work to build this. Okay, honey, I'm off to work to buy the, to, to build the uh, giant robot today. All right, hey, by the way, has anyone explained to you why you're doing that? Uh, no, I guess not. They haven't explained it. I have no idea. Now, people online are saying that Japan is, is going to take over the world with its giant robots. They're saying that we should be shaking in our tiny boots as we behold the future of warfare. No. Do, do you realize how utterly useless this hunk of metal would be in the context of modern warfare? First of all, you could easily knock it over with a missile from a fighter jet. That would be it. Probably a strong wind would do it. And then it will crash down and crush whatever happens to be underneath it. Speaking of crushing things, wh- where would you use this robot? You couldn't use it to defend your own cities because you just end up destroying as many buildings as you save, which, if you recall, was a major problem in Power Rangers. Are you going to try to launch some sort of foreign invasion with these things? The enemy would see you coming literally from a mile away, lumbering along at the, you know, the, the speed of two miles an hour in your giant tin cans. A few missiles later, and all of your robots are splayed out on the ground like really expensive dominoes. You know where this would come in handy? If you were, say, laying siege to a fortress in medieval Europe, I could see it being useful in that setting. But unfortunately, Japan is about 600 years too too late for that. It would also be useful in the Star Wars universe, where the technology to make fully conscious robots is so ubiquitous that every hobo in the galaxy has five of them apiece, and everyone flies around in spaceships that can exceed the speed of light like it's nothing. And yet the most advanced weapon is a laser sword, you know, that you need to be within two feet of of the enemy to use. So in that sort of reality where technology is somehow a million years ahead of us and 700 years behind us at the same time, I, I could see the giant robot filling a role. But not in this reality. The reality we happen to live in and are stuck with. Listen, I would love if there was a real function for giant robots in this world. I would, but there isn't. 
And so for that reason, Japan is canceled. And I remind you again, now is a good time to go. If you're watching on YouTube, go to youtube.com slash Matt Walsh and subscribe. Uh, and uh, if you don't, of course, you are canceled as well. We'll leave it there. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for listening. Godspeed. The Matt Walsh Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producers are Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Our technical producer is Austin Stevens, edited by Danny D'Amico, and our audio is mixed by Robin Fenderson. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production, copyright Daily Wire 2020. While Democrats exploit the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the late justice sends a message on her final wishes from beyond the grave. Then rioters burn down more of our politics out of love and compassion, and BLM deletes its beliefs. Check it out on The Michael Knowles Show.